in the image on paper too. If you don't go based on what you see in the picture, you cannot get full credit. Sometimes you can't get any credit at all, especially if they say something like, using the figure whatever, using figure 1.1 or 2.3, or in reference to figure blah, blah, blah. Explain why. If you do not reference the figure, you cannot get maximum points. Do you understand this? You must read that question, and you must use that question in its own answer. So, other things that we notice about this, besides that thymine and uric, oops, besides that thymine and uracil are, dif are different for the different molecules. DNA is a double helix. RNA is a single strand. It's a double-stranded molecule. And the nitrogenous bases are paired by hydrogen bonding. We can't see that here. There is a sugar phosphate backbone. And here there's also a sugar phosphate backbone. For the difference between the pentose sugars, there's the difference. Deoxyribose has deoxy, one less oxygen. It is deoxygenated. There is one less oxygen at the two prime carbon. Your sound is getting into the sound. It's still getting into the sound. All right. We'll have to edit that part out. What is we you're adding? <sighs> so at the two prime carbon of the sugar, <clears throat> deoxyribose has a hydrogen and ribose has a hydroxyl group. That is the only difference between these pentose sugars. One less oxygen. This chemical structure is important. The one prime is where the nitrogenous base will attach. This hydroxyl group will be removed and the nitro nitrogenous base will be placed there by a condensation reaction. The hydrox, the, um, the phosphate group will attach to the five prime carbon by replacing this hydroxyl group here by a condensation reaction. So, There is a difference here. Adenine and guanine have two rings. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil all have one ring. Two rings makes them purines. One ring makes them pyrimidines. Purine, two rings. Pyrimidines, one ring. That's the difference. That's the difference in groups. Purines of nitrogenous bases are divided into purines and pyrimidines. Purines have two rings, pyrimidines have one ring. They also fit together. And they will always fit together, only in this configuration. Five, Oh, sorry, three to five, three to five. Anti-parallel, complementary, double-stranded. Thymine to adenine has two hydrogen bonds. One hydrogen bond, dashed line. One hydrogen bond, dashed line. One plus one is two. 
guanine and cytosine has three hydrogen bonds. One dashed line, one dashed line, one dashed line. One plus one plus one is three. This is anti-parallel, three to five, complementary, double-stranded. Adenine and thymine form two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine form three hydrogen bonds. The more hydrogen bonds you have, the more stable your molecule. <clears throat> so how do you make DNA, so what DNA sequences are the most stable? The ones with a lot of GC pairs. That is something that may come up in a paper one question but they will definitely ask you the number of hydrogen bonds. What is the maximum number of hydrogen bonds? Or how many hydrogen bonds are available here? Or what must this be? What must this molecule be? And it will show three hydrogen bonds, but it won't have a name next to it. <clears throat> and they'll show three hydrogen bonds. If there's three hydrogen bonds and it has two rings, it can only be guanine. If there's two hydrogen bonds and there's two rings, it can only be adenine. If there's three hydrogen bonds and there's one ring, it can only be cytosine. If there's two hydrogen bonds and one ring, it could be thymine or it could be uracil, depending on whether or not you are making RNA or you are just dealing with double-stranded DNA. But if they give you something with three double bonds and ask you to identify what it is, you can tell. You do not need to memorize structure. You memorize number of hydrogen bonds. Number of hydrogen bonds. A to T, two. G to C, three. A to U, two. So that's adenine and thymine. That's adenine and uracil. Both have two double bonds, I have two hydrogen bonds. My apologies. The only difference is a methyl group over here missing in uracil. That's it. That's the only difference. A methyl, a methyl group missing over here. The way base pairing works is in DNA, you only have thymine, no uracil. So A to T, T to A, and G to C, C to G. That's it. When you are binding, DNA to RNA, you get A to U, G to C, T to A, and C to G. Because DNA is the blue here. DNA is A, G, T, C. RNA is U, C, A, G. There is no T in RNA. The British don't like it. Well, they like it just fine. <clears throat> when you have RNA to RNA binding, like you would have in translation, where you have mRNA binding to tRNA in codon to anticodon pairings, A will correspond to U, and U will correspond to A, G to C, and C to G. Just like in DNA to DNA, A to T and T to A, G and C to G and C, C and G, and whatnot. RNA has U, DNA has T. When you are converting from one to the other, you just remember what you are going from to two. That's it. You just remember in your spelling.
What letters are you using? This is not complicated. <clears throat> so, for the sake of simplicity, drawing a nucleic acid and reading a nucleic acid on the Cambridge exam, phosphate will look like this. A pentose sugar will look like that. And a nitrogenous base will look like that. Or it will look like that. Or it will look like that. Or it will look like that. That's it. That's it. That's all it is. That is the simplified form. <clears throat> and when you draw them anti-parallel to one another, They are upside down. Let's say that this is A and this is T. One double bond, two double bonds. That's it. If this were, for example, not A and T, if they were G and C, one, two, three double bonds. The number of dashed lines. So, in a paper one question, which is correct for nucleic acids? If they are not anti-parallel, it is wrong. If the number of bonds is wrong for G and C and T and A, it's wrong. You must memorize number of hydrogen bonds between these nucleic acids. <clears throat> Anti-parallel, double-stranding. Those spelling distinctions, these are important for the paper too. Adenine and ribose is adenosine. Do not spell adenosine when you mean adenine. When you are talking about the nitrogenous base, you say adenine. When you are talking about specifically ribonucleic acid with adenine nitrogenous base, you say adenosine. <clears throat> that distinction is important. Spelling counts. Thymine is a nitrogenous base. Thiamine is vitamin B1. Do not make this spelling error. It is a common error. <clears throat> Pyrimidines. That was me making silly comments. Don't worry about that. So, this is when I was silly about ATP. ATP, in its simplified form, is adenosine, which is ribose, and adenine nitrogen, oops, the adenine nitrogenous base and the ribose pentose sugar and three phosphate groups. Adenine ribose, adenosine. Tri, one, two, three, tri, phosphate. Adenosine triphosphate, ATP. You make ATP by a condensation reaction. You break ATP by hydrolysis. So you add H2O and you get inorganic phosphate and ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Adenosine, adenine, Mitrogenous base, ribose, nucleic, uh, ribose, pentose sugar, and two, one, two, di 
phosphate, two phosphate groups. And the inorganic phosphate, ADP and PI, inorganic phosphate. Inorganic because it has no carbon. This is the phosphodiester bond. It is still a condensation reaction. You are still taking a hydroxyl group from the phosphate group at the five carbon and combining it with the three prime hydroxyl group on the pentose sugar. This hydroxyl group and this hydrogen will lead together. And this oxygen will form a covalent bond with the three prime carbon. And you are left with a phosphodiester bond and H2O. And of course, I was silly again and told you it was condensation reaction. Barry Manilow, my old joke, returning once again, because I'm using my old slides. <clears throat> Here is how you draw it. Oh, I was wrong. The hydroxyl group is leaving from the phosphate. My apologies. I'm old. I forget things from time to time. The hydroxyl group leaves from the sugar, and the hydroxyl group leaves from the phosphate here. And this oxygen adds its electrons to the phosphate here, becomes an electron receptor, and you get your phosphodiester bond that way. So this is how you will draw it on the Cambridge exam if it comes up. You will circle that hydrogen and that OH, and you will show the water leaving. And then you will draw the new phosphodiester bond. You will draw the new chemical formula over here. Redraw it. You have the time. Whether you think you do or not, you have the time because they drew the original for you, most likely. If they drew the original for you, all you have to do is copy. Copying gets you points. Copying their chemical structure. The full chemical structure, as long as you change nothing else but the bond formation that you showed, gets you points. Circle the interacting hydrogen and hydroxyl group, show the water leaving, show this final bond configuration plus H2O. That is your condensation reaction. Phosphodiester linkage, phosphodiester bond. That is its name. That is what you call it when they ask you, what is this bond called? And it's worth one point. Because always, when they ask you, what is the name of this thing? It's worth a point. Sometimes they'll ask you the name of both things in the picture and both of them together are worth one point. Sometimes they'll ask you the name of each, then they, they ask you the name of two things and it's worth two points, in which case usually each one is worth a point. Naming things is easy points in unit one questions. So in terms of numbering, the one carbon is here because this is the most interesting volatile group. The ether linkage, the one four ether linkage is the most interesting group here. So one, two, three, four, five. These are the points of attachment. The one carbon is where you attach your nitrogenous base. The five carbon is where you attach your phosphate. This brings into question, call, this calls into the idea of five prime to three prime directionality. Because phosphodiester bonds form from the five prime phosphate group and the three prime hydroxyl group, that is what they form between. So because you are always getting that, you will have directionality in nucleic acids as they link up together, one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And during DNA replication, you will always go from five to three. If I flipped it, it's the same. If I give you a reading frame, you know what you're doing. You may not always be given a reading frame. 
If you're not, just, just, bond, just bond them and link them as you would. Just in order, in whatever order they give them to you. If you're not given a reading frame, five prime and three prime, just link them in order. <clears throat> so this is more of the anti-parallel strand. The three prime end links with the five prime end and the three prime to five prime. And they, they anti-parallel, complementary, double stranding. A to T, G to C, C to G, etc. My hydrogen bonds, the dotted lines. My phosphates, the yellow stuff. You already know this. I don't need to do this again. So, Chargaff's rule. We can stop here and pick this up actually tomorrow. This is probably a good place to stop.